question that's been asked that I'll just address for everybody. Uh, some of you have found that either in the study guide or the practice problem set for chapter 17, there are isolated, hopefully few references to chapter 23, and you're wondering what the heck. Uh, sorry about that. I thought I caught all of those. A previous edition of the text, uh, our chapter 17 was actually that chapter 23. So this is just a find and replace error on my part. You can feel free to ignore and or neglect anything labeled chapter 23 for right now, or alternatively just change the 23 to a 17 and go find that problem and it might be useful practice, I don't know. But I did not intend for you to be going to chapter 23. So hopefully that's clear. All right, um, and we are pressing record. What's going on? I have no idea what happened. <coughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, we're going to spend the next 10 minutes, maybe 12, talking about the origin of this 4n plus 2 rule. And this is, recall, we've said that things like benzene that are cyclic, fully conjugated, and have the right number of electrons are aromatic and are especially stable whereas molecules that are cyclic and fully conjugated but have the wrong number of electrons, that is 4n, are what we call anti-aromatic and especially unstable, okay? And today we're gonna to figure out why that is. Now there's, there's, we could spend 40, 50 minutes talking about this, but it wouldn't help prepare you for the exam. So I'm gonna to try to restrain myself and just tell you what you basically need to know. Uh, though the origin of this comes down to molecular orbital theory. And depending on where, you, where and when you took 351, you may or may not have had a lot of that. So uh, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. Uh, basic ideas and principles of MO theory. The idea is that in MO theory, we mix atomic orbitals together to get molecular orbitals out. For example, if you remember the origin of the pi bond for say an alkene like this, you recall that the pi bond comes from which atomic orbitals on carbons one and two? P orbitals, right? We're looking at this alkene on the side. You have a P orbital on carbon one and a P orbital on carbon two. Uh, we, we're gonna use color or shading to indicate the sign of the wave function, that's a mathematical function that describes the shape and energy of that orbital. Uh, in the plane of the sigma bonds, that orbital goes to zero, that's called a node. And these two p orbitals can add together to form two new molecular orbitals. I get one, which I'm gonna call pi, from the 2p orbital on carbon one added to the 2p orbital on carbon two. I get another, which I'm calling pi star, by taking the 2p orbital on carbon one and subtracting the 2p orbital on carbon two. What this looks like, if we were to draw this, again, superimposed on the structure of our alkene, uh, would look like this, the pi orbital, uh, would look like side by side overlap of those two p orbitals. There would be a lobe of orbital above the plane of the sigma bonds and another lobe below the plane of the sigma bonds. Hopefully you can imagine that this is what you get if you just mix those two orbitals together side by side. The pi star you get by mixing the two orbitals together side by side but with opposite wave function sign. And you can see that when we do that, because the wave function sign changes as you move from the orbital on the left to the one on the right, we actually go through zero. We go through what's called a node where the uh, wave function has uh, a value, wave function is Greek letter psi, goes through uh, zero there. We call the one on top pi a bonding orbital. We call the one on the bottom an anti-bonding orbital. If you rank them in energy, uh, with the y-axis being energy, the pi orbital is lower in energy than the pi star orbital. 
we have two electrons that are involved in the pi bond, and they both end up in the pi bonding orbital, and the antibonding orbital is empty. You with me? Vaguely familiar? Okay. A stable covalent bond, we haven't necessarily talked about this a lot uh, in some of your, uh, perhaps you haven't talked about this a lot in some of your previous classes. A stable covalent bond consists of a filled bonding orbital and an empty antibonding orbital, all right? Now, that's just a pi bond. If we put two pi bonds conjugated to each other, we can actually mix more than two p orbitals together to get more than two molecular orbitals out. You would have learned about this in chapter, what is it, 12 of 351 when you learned about conjugation, dienes, and the Diels-Alder reaction. If, if that sounds unfamiliar, you'd like a refresher, you can go look on the content page of Learning Suite and click on either the notes or the videos from, from chapter 12 in 351. We don't have a lot of time to say anything about that today, but I do want to show you how MO theory applies to benzene. So in benzene, as we discussed last time, here is an overhead view of the benzene hexagon. And on atoms one, two, three, four, five, and six, we have atomic p orbitals on all of those atoms, right? And I've drawn them before. Here is our top down view. I'm just going to draw today the top, well, the top lobe of each of those p orbitals. The plane of the page here is a node where wave function goes to zero. And then on the other side of the page below where we can just see part of the edge is you've got the pink lobe of uh, each of those p orbitals, okay? So now, as opposed to when I had just a pi bond and I mixed two p orbitals together to get two new molecular orbitals out, pi and pi star, now for benzene, I'm going to take these six atomic p orbitals, one on each of the atoms, and I'm going to mix them together and I'm going to get six new pi molecular orbitals out, okay? Now, um, how do I do that? We could talk through it qualitatively or we could have a computer do it. The bottom line is it comes down to maths, which I presume you don't want to know. Um, if you do, we can talk about it. But what I will do is I'll actually draw these orbitals for you you won't need to know where they come from or why they look the way they do. You will need to know how to determine which of them is lower in energy than others, how to rank them in relative order of energy. Thankfully, that's easy if you can see when color changes or shading changes and if you can count. So um, that part is not hard. These orbitals are shown in your text, and I'll draw them for you here. It turns out um, that when you arrange six p orbitals together, the maths of molecular orbital theory have what I'm going to call some symmetry requirements. So if you, if you ask me, why does the orbital look that way, I'm going to fall back to uh, the symmetry requirements. Okay. So um, the first one looks like this. Um, it literally looks like a cloud of electron density above the plane of the benzene ring and then below the plane of the benzene ring like this. This is not how most people draw it because um, they look at that and they're like, what is that, a benzene sandwich? Um, sometimes it's helpful to me or to organic chemists to draw a molecular orbital by showing you where it comes from in terms of the component p orbitals on the individual carbon atoms. So a lot of people will draw this first molecular orbital for benzene like this, uh, almost the same way that I drew over on the right or over on the left earlier 
on this page where I was showing you the individual atomic p orbitals on benzene. Basically, you have side-by-side -side overlap of p orbitals to make this one unified molecular orbital, okay? If you don't like how I drew it there, we can come over to Spartan and uh, just draw benzene and then show you the lowest energy orbital and it looks like that. So in red is the lobe that's above the plane of the page. In blue is the lobe that's below the plane of the page. You can sort of see how you get that orbital from side by side overlap of individual p orbitals all with the same wave function sign. Okay? Questions about that? Right. So um, that's the lowest energy one. We're going to call that one pi 1. And notice that the pi 1 orbital only has one node, and it's in the plane of the page. There are no other nodes that are perpendicular to the page, and there's uh, consistent overlap between each of the atoms. There's no nodes in between each of the atoms. It turns out that pi 1 is a bonding orbital, and because it has none of these nodes that are perpendicular to the page, it's the lowest energy orbital that we have. All right, so what about the other ones? So there are two orbitals next. You might suspect that the higher energy orbitals are going to have one node. And it turns out there are two ways for a hexagon to have one node. One of them is to have the node go through those two opposite atoms, and the other way is to have the node go through two opposite bonds. Those are sort of two independent ways to have one node in benzene. So if you choose the one on the left, you end up with an orbital that looks like this. There's... Um, orange lobe here and then pink lobe over here uh, and I can show you this orbital in Spartan okay in this orbital if we number the atoms of the benzene ring and I forgot how we did it over there yeah okay one two three four five and six the node here coincides with, is perpendicular to the plane of the page, and it coincides with atoms 2 and 5. And then there's orbital on 1 and 6, and on 3 and 4. When you see this, you need to envision that an electron pair in this orbital would simultaneously occupy all of the space that's drawn. In other words, a single pair of electrons would be above carbons 1 and 6, and below carbons 1 and 6, and above carbons 3 and 4, and below carbons 3 and 4. That's an electron adopting a standing wave, and it simultaneously occupies all the space there. It, however, does not occupy the blue line where the electron goes to zero. Okay? Um, that's one option. The next option looks like this. And there would be also opposite wave function sine lobes below the plane of the page. Again, we can start with orange here, and then below the plane of the page there, pink below the plane of the page here, and above the plane of the page there. So what we see for the one on the right is that the node is between carbons 2 and 3 and between carbons 5 and 6. We have one lobe of electron density here, both above and below the plane of the page, and then here above and below the plane of the page. Both of these orbitals have one node, and so it turns out that pi 2 and pi 3, in, in, in MO theory you can often rank orbitals in energy based on how many nodes they have. This is why I told you you needed to be able to count. Pi 1 has zero nodes that are aside from the plane of the page. Both Pi 2 and Pi 3 have only one node. So it turns out these two orbitals are equal in energy 
or what we would call uh, a term from like mathematics is degenerate, okay? That doesn't mean they're immoral, it just means that they are equal in energy, okay? Um, so, if we're building up an energy diagram for benzene, and we let the y-axis be energy, the lowest energy pi type bonding orbital for benzene is pi one, and then some energy above pi one, it's higher in energy because they both have one node, you have pi two and pi three. Okay, so here's pi one lower in energy, pi one has zero nodes, and then pi two and pi three have the same number of energy. This is, if you look, we've just now answered the question of where the 4n plus 2 rule comes from. Go ahead. Do you not want us to count the node in the plane of the page? Uh, do, do we, no, I don't want you to count the node in the plane of the page because, or you can, just notice that all of the pi orbitals we're going to draw today share that node. We're looking for differences. So because they all have that, we just ignore it. Yeah. Others. Okay, you should start to see where the 4n plus 2 rule comes from because when you have aromaticity, which comes from overlap of atomic p orbitals on adjacent atoms all around a ring, the outcome of that mathematically always gives you one lower energy orbital, pi 1, where there are two electrons. And then from then on, you have pairs of degenerate higher energy orbitals. Each one of those can accept two electrons, but because they come in pairs, there's four, right? So there's the two, and then there's the four n, where n is an integer zero, one, two, three, or four, right? So um, I won't draw the higher energy antibonding orbitals for benzene. I could do that, but they're in your text. And you would see that, and it, well, mm, every time I say I'm not going to do something, then I go ahead and do it. So there's a pi 4 and a pi 5 that have that are equal in energy and they are higher in energy than pi 2 and pi 3 go ahead and extrapolate and tell me how many nodes pi 2 I'm sorry pi 4 and pi 5 have two right okay and then go and tell me uh, extrapolate how many nodes does pi 6 have three okay and actually um, you could pretty well draw what pi 6 would look like. You need three nodes and you've got pi 16, what the heck is going on there? Uh, pi 6, you need three nodes. Turns out the only way you can do this and obey the symmetry requirements is to have the three nodes be like that. And so pi 6 literally looks like six adjacent p orbitals all with opposite wave function sign. I'm going to not draw what's below the plane of the page just to facilitate rapid drawing. Um, if you want to see what that looks like, even Spartan's not going to show it to you apparently. Um, pi 4 and pi 5, you, you should think of, okay, what are the ways that I could have two nodes and as before, you're going to see that there are two different ways to have two nodes. You could imagine um, something like this. Oops. Am I going to get this wrong? Probably. Ugh. I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm going straight to the source to make sure I don't. Please do not tell my colleagues. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay, I was pretty much right. But it's good to feel secure. So, 
So in the one that I've just drawn, interestingly enough, you have a node that co coincides with carbons two and five, and then another node that, co that splits the difference between one and six and three and four. And then for the last one, pi five, you have uh, a really weird and sort of interesting orbital that looks like this. Where you have nodes in between atoms one and two, between two and three, but not between three and four or one and six, and then again between four and five and five and six, okay? Now, uh, the pattern that emerges from aromatic molecules is that you always have one lowest energy orbital, that's the one with zero nodes, and then everything else comes in pairs until you get to the very top orbital. And uh, two electrons go in the lowest energy one, and then every pair of degenerate orbitals can accept four electrons, two in each. If you fill uh, all of the bonding orbitals and none of the antibonding orbitals, that's where the special stabilization comes from. I guess one thing that would be useful for your understanding is to say that this dotted line separates the bonding orbitals from the antibonding orbitals. And so the genius of aromaticity is if you have 4n plus 2 electrons, you fill all of the bonding orbitals and none of the antibonding orbitals. All right. Um, yes? So based on like pi 2 and pi 4, are like carbons 2 and 5 really less electrons than like rich? Are carbons 2 and 5 less electron rich because nodes coincide there? Um, <laughs> Great question, and the answer is no, because all the carbons in benzene are identical to each other. They have to be. So, like, how, how do I, how do I like, rationalize that? How do, you, how do you rationalize that and wrap your mind around it? Ba basically, what you need to do, um, which is really hard, what you're going to come out of this with is the same picture that resonance gave you. In benzene, I have six identical carbons that are each on average involved in half a pi bond on either side. And if you were able to, in your mind, average out pi one, pi two, and pi three, you would come up with that same picture. Yes? Right, if there were an odd number of carbons, we would run out of the top orbital, but they would still come in degenerate pairs all the way up. Yeah. Um, yes? What would it look like for an anti-aromatic ring? Sure. What would this look like for an anti-aromatic ring? I can answer that question. Before I do that, though, I want to just give you a sense for what you might encounter on an exam. What I've done before on exams is said, look at this orbital, pi 4. Which of the following other options is degenerate or equal in energy to pi 4? To answer that question, you figure out how many nodes the orbitals have, and the one that has the same number of nodes is its degenerate pair. Okay? Or rank these orbitals in energy. Right? Uh, okay, so the interesting thing about what MO theory tells you is there's a mnemonic device shown in your text that you can use for simple aromatic systems to predict what the energy diagram should look like for these pi orbitals. Uh, it involves drawing polygons. It's the inscribed polygon method. But you basically make a circle. What a lovely circle that is. And then you take your aromatic ring and you draw the aromatic ring and put the points on the circle. And you put one point down. Every time the point touches the circle, that then is the location in energy of an orbital on your energy diagram. Oh. <laughs> and interestingly enough, it's quantitative. If you draw your circle with a, with a compass 
and you measure the radius of the circle, the difference in, in height between these pi 2 and pi 3 orbitals is proportional to the energy, the actual energy difference between the pi 1 orbital and the pi 2 and pi 3 orbital. It's really bizarre how that, how that works out. Okay. Um, and that has to do with maths and stuff. So, uh, of course, we already knew what the benzene one looked like. So, uh, and we can tell that benzene's aromatic because you fill the pi one and then pi two and pi three are filled. Now, you can do this for larger or for other systems as well. So let's do, oh, it doesn't, it didn't like my circle. It turns out if you get really good at this, you don't need to draw the circle either. Let's do cyclobutadiene simply draw the square point down. Notice that it's close enough, right? <laughs> it's not a perfect square. Here is the pi one orbital for cyclobutadiene. Notice that pi two and pi three, even though we're not sure what they look like, notice where they are. Um, I'll point out that the halfway point of the circle, the diameter of the circle that's halfway up the energy diagram, this is the dividing line between bonding versus anti-bonding orbitals. So notice how that for cyclobutadiene, that dividing line between bonding versus anti-bonding orbitals Pi 2 and pi 3 lie right along that line. In other words, that's, it's, like, it's like those are orbitals that are not even at, at the bonding level anymore. So now, how many pi electrons does cyclobutadiene have? Four. So I fill pi 1. That's a bonding orbital. What do I do with pi 2 and pi 3? I only have two electrons left. You learned that in Gen Chem, right? That's because of uh, Hund's rule. I know you're dying to learn the quantum mechanical origin of Hund's rule. If you are, you should take Chemistry 552 from my colleague Dan S, and he will teach you that. No thanks, you're saying. You should take it. Um, so what does this tell you? What is the reactivity of cyclobutadiene? Does it react like a molecule with two pi bonds? It's a di radical. It reacts. If it, if it did have this ge geometry, it would react like it was a di radical. And, and get this, you're drawing it as though there are two bonds. There are not. There's just one. The other two electrons are non-bonding. This is the origin of how bad anti-aromaticity is, and this is the origin of the 4n rule. When you only have 4n electrons, you fill the lowest energy one, but eventually you get to a high energy degenerate pair, and you get the di radical. Okay? Test this out. You can do this with any, any regular polygon. You want to do it with a five-membered ring or a seven-membered ring, go for it, but you'll come to the same conclusion. Yes? For something that has heteroatoms in it, like uh, nitrogen, like imidazole, this is a uh, way to go on busting out that heterocycle name, by the way. Imidazole's great. Um, all you would do for something that imidazole, you would treat it like a regular pentagon. You're going to draw, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. You're going to draw a uh, five member. I just, come on, there we go. You're going to draw a, a pentagon inscribed on the surface of a circle. It's not a perfect pentagon, but you would have a pi 1 orbital that's low in energy, and then you'd have pi 2 and pi 3. And then up higher in energy, you would have pi 4 and pi 5. You'd fill with the available electrons. We've already been through with the midazole how you have six pi electrons. And so that's how you can tell that it's aromatic. Um, 
I'm sorry, I think you're saying something about two electrons in a p orbital, but I'm not, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, okay, with the nitrogen on the right, like you correctly noted, this lone pair is in an sp2 orbital. This lone pair is in a p orbital, which when combined with the other four p orbitals in the molecule makes this system of pi molecular orbitals. Yep. Yes? Um, no, uh, sorry, I, uh, I think, I'm not actually, I, I think I sort of have an idea of where your question's coming from, but if you have a specific example, you may be good, save me some time. Okay, sure. Um, so here is a five-membered ring molecule containing oxygen. This is called furan, by the way. Um, oxygen has two lone pairs. One of them is going to be in a p orbital where it can participate in resonance. The other cannot. The other has to be in an sp2 orbital. And so the number of pi electrons you have is two, four, six. Okay, oxygen's not choosing, it has to be that way. Yeah. Okay, others? Yeah. So, if, you, so if we don't end up with a diradical, we can assume the molecule is aromatic. If you fill up with the available orbitals and your bonding orbitals are filled completely, then yeah, it's going to be aromatic. Okay, others? Yes. Are there examples where electrons would go into an antibonding orbital? Possibly if it were like a dianion. Um, I, there is a special case of that, which we could talk about if you wanted to, but it wouldn't really add a lot to the class, so. Thank you for deflecting a potential exam questions from these poor unsuspecting individuals. Okay. Well, what we've just done is illustrated the principle of time estimates. I said it was going to take 12 minutes, it took 24 or longer. And uh, a friend in, in uh, my postdoc days told me that anytime your boss asks you how long is it going to take, and you say something that you think is realistic, you have to both double it and move to the next higher unit of time. So if two days becomes four weeks, Four weeks becomes eight months, <laughs> and so on. So just be careful. <laughs> yeah, we ought to have that done in a few months, four years later. <laughs> that is often how science works. Um, okay, so there's more we could say, um, but I think that probably needs to be the end of chapter 18 for us. Um, the text does some things which I would really dearly love to talk about, about non-covalent interactions involving benzene rings. We will come to back to that maybe when we start talking about peptide, protein, and nucleic acid structure. All right, now we're going to go back to something I said at the beginning of class on Friday, where I told you that uh, aromaticity makes benzene especially stable. And I pointed out that benzene doesn't react like a normal alkene. You now know why that's the case, because of the special stability that's given to benzene rings. Uh, and I told you that you could get benzene to react if you souped up your electrophile. So uh, our original electrophile was bromine, which has a weak BR-BR sigma bond. You've broken that bond before when doing addition of bromine to alkenes, like in 351. I told you last time that we can use a, a Lewis acid catalyst, in this case, iron tribromide. You don't need to worry too much about what's going on with the iron, other than think of it as a molecule that has 
some low-lying empty, orbital, uh, empty orbitals that electrons can be shared with. Uh, the iron catalyst activates the bromine as an electrophile through a mechanism I will show you. But when that happens, you can get benzene to attack the bromine as an electrophile. Benzene acts as a nucleophile to attack the bromine. But interestingly, you don't get the expected product for an alkene. Notice how in an alkene, the two, we get two bromines added, one on either of the two carbons of the double bond. You might have predicted, oh, well, for benzene, we should just have one of those two double bonds uh, react, and we ought to get something like that. The answer is, uh-uh, we don't see any of this ever. And instead, we see a substitution product. And it turns out the reason we see the substitution product is, what do you notice about that substitution product? It's still aromatic, right? Still got that stability. Whereas this one, this proposed addition product, no longer aromatic because it's not fully conjugated. So it turns out the, the unifying story from chapters 18 and, or 19 and 20 is preserving and restoring aromaticity at basically all costs. So let's show you this reaction. The reaction that I just showed you is called um, aryl halogenation, if you want to put a name to it. And it is an example of a larger class of reactions called electrophilic aromatic substitution. Why do we call it a substitution reaction? Well, look at what's missing from benzene. We used to, have, our formula used to be C6H6, now it's C6H5Br. We swapped out a hydrogen for a bromine. The bromine replaced the hydrogen. Where did it go? I'll tell you, it's not that hard. A base removed it, but, um, and not even a very, a very strong base. So let's show you first for aryl halogenation how we generate the super electrophile that's going to work to react with benzene. So it turns out that your Lewis acid catalyst, iron tribromide, is the electrophile. And Br2 is actually the nucleophile. So lone pairs on the Br attack an empty orbital on iron. You don't have to worry about which one it is. It's one of the D orbitals. That's simply a Lewis acid, Lewis base reaction. We create a new sigma bond between one of the bromines and iron. Now you gotta keep formal charge rules, so that puts a positive formal charge on this bromine, which is bonded now to two things, and that would put a negative formal charge on the iron. Nevertheless, remember when Br itself is an electrophile and a nucleophile attacks one of the Brs, the leaving group is what? It's Br minus. Notice here, the leaving group is something even better than Br minus. It's a Br with a positive charge on it, something that's electron deficient. It's waiting and anxious to accept these electrons in that Br, Br bond, okay? So basically you've turned, you've converted regular Br2, which has a good leaving group, to even better a molecule in which bromine is attached to an even better leaving group, okay? It's okay if you don't understand totally why adding this Lewis acid catalyst makes the Br a better leaving group. At that point, the molecule is reactive, reactive enough for benzene to attack. So uh, we've got three sets of pi electrons in benzene. Which ones are gonna attack? We don't know, they're all the same, are they? Hmm, at least from the resonance structure, it looks like they're the same. From the MO theory picture, four of them are the same, but two of them are lower in energy. 
We don't have a really good way from arrow pushing to specify for arrow pushing from a regular benzene Lewis structure to specify that it's the either the pi two or the pi three electrons that do the attacking and not the pi one electrons. We we don't we don't have that. But that's what's going on here. It's electrons in one of these two higher energy pi orbitals that's, that are gonna do the attacking. Uh, from our perspective, drawing it just like this, we'll choose one of the pi bonds, attack the bromine, break the bromine-bromine bond. Now, um, there are two atoms, A and B, associated with that pi bond that we use to attack. So, one of them is going to get the new bromine, and the other should get what? Positive charge, right? Now I'm drawing in hydrogens that were implied but not originally shown, okay? One of them is going to get the positive charge. We will come back to whether it's important which one gets the positive charge. The answer is yes and we're gonna have some regioselectivity issues to deal with. The answer is yes in certain contexts. Right now it doesn't matter because all of those atoms are identical, right? Okay, so this is the stage at which, uh, you remember the product I told you didn't form above? The product where there'd be bromines on adjacent atoms and we don't observe that one. This is the stage at which you might say, oh, doesn't Br minus come in and attack that, that carbon B? The answer is no, because something even better can happen. Br minus probably leaves the Lewis acid catalyst. I think this is what's shown in your text. And it actually does an E1 style elimination reaction removing the proton that's on the same carbon as the other bromine so that electrons can kick down, make a double bond, and restore aromaticity. Yay. Okay. So you might expect the energy diagram for this reaction to have starting materials here go through a high energy transition state to get to this carbocationic intermediate, and then down another transition state to go to product. Essentially follows the same kind of diagram as you expect for a stepwise reaction, kind of like the SN1 reaction. But this second step, restoring aromaticity, is fast. The first step where you break aromaticity is slow. Why is it slow? Because it's uphill. Because you've got to destroy aromaticity to get there. Okay? What I've just shown you is the reaction for this chapter. Yeah? Where is the DR Yeah, I uh, glossed over that a little bit. Notice that after, uh, after the first step of nucleophilic attack, a byproduct that I didn't show would be like this. And I've said that FeBr3 is our Lewis acid catalyst, which means you've got to regenerate it. So all that happens is Br hops off there. Yep. Okay, what else? Yeah? Would it ever happen that the iron, like negatively charged iron, would attack the hydrogen? Could the negatively charged iron, iron remove the hydrogen? Uh, that would depend on stuff I don't know about how strong iron-hydrogen bonds are. So I think that's reasonable. Frankly, most of the time for this removal step, instead of actually showing who's doing the deprotonating, we will often just write a base of some sort. We don't care what it is. It doesn't have to be very strong because the pKa of that proton is super, super low because the conjugate base, which is aromatic, is so stable. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to be consistent with maybe what your textbook shows here using Br minus to do the deprotonating, but it could be any number of things. Okay. Uh, yeah? So um, I, I, I guess I can accept that that, that, uh, that, that uh, deprotonation with Br minus like, does happen. I can understand like, why it would happen, but why wouldn't the attack at that positively charged hydrogen happen, right? Like, you don't know everything that, like, 
if you attack at that positively charged hydrogen, you get this product, which is no longer fully conjugated and it's not aromatic. So um, you lose the chance to go to a very much more stable product. Okay. So does it still happen and then it just kind of flips back to... Uh, it's never observed, so it's difficult to say whether it just doesn't happen or whether it happens and then goes back. Yeah. But you only observe this. Now, aromatic molecule attacks, carbocation intermediate, re-aromatizing or deprotonating to re-establish aromaticity. That is the theme for four or five new reactions that we will talk about. The only difference is going to be in the identity of the electrophile. So we're going to go through that pretty quickly uh, in the remaining minutes today and then again on Wednesday to talk about just mixing and matching electrophiles with benzene rings. And then what we're going to do is talk about what if your benzene ring already has something on it? How does that affect which atom gets the new electrophile in the reaction? Okay, so we'll do, we'll try to do the two easy, two, the aryl nitration's pretty easy. We'll try to do the two other easy ones today, and then we'll start next time with the slightly more difficult ones. So the next one in our list is called aryl nitration. I'll show you the reaction overall. This involves taking a benzene ring, you use nitric acid, and then you also use sulfuric acid and it ends up doing an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction which puts a nitro group on the benzene ring. By the way, it's probably useful to you to get right now to review if you don't remember what the Lewis structure of the nitro group is. It's sort of a Zwitter ionic structure. You got a positive formal charge on the nitrogen and the negative formal charge on one of the oxygens. Notice that that uh, negatively charged oxygen is actually resonance stabilized with the other one, that that negative charge can be simultaneously shared on both oxygens, though I won't draw that. You're gonna need to get used to knowing this as nitro. That, res that structure is gonna come uh, you're going to be valuable to you a little bit later. Um, the electrophile in this reaction is not nitric acid and it's not sulfuric acid. It's something that forms when you bring them together. Your text, I believe, has some arrow pushing for how this forms. It's not hard. It's just boring enough that um, it's not worth our time. So your electrophile is this NO2 cation. And it has a positive formal charge on a nitrogen that's electron poor. That's very, nitrogen's electronegative. The positive formal charge means that this nitrogen is, is very electron poor. The fact that it's bonded to two oxygens uh, makes it even more electron poor. So we're going to show pi electrons from benzene attacking the nitrogen. If we stopped there, we'd have too many bonds to nitrogen, so we got to break one of the nitrogen-oxygen pi bonds. That's going to create the familiar intermediate where I have the new bond between the benzene carbon and my electrophile, and then I have a positive charge on the adjacent carbon. Then I'm going to show some base, water perhaps, or the conjugate base of sulfuric acid perhaps, removing the proton, restoring aromaticity, and that getting to my uh, nitro product. Um, and then the last one, which we have, ooh, 40 seconds for. Double and to the next unit of time. So 80 minutes now to do this next reaction. <laughs> I'll just draw this one briefly. I don't have time to write out the title. This involves sulfuric acid and SO3 as a gas. Uh, and you end up installing the following functional group. I'll go through a mechanism for that next time, but you will see as you read in the text that it likewise involves an intermediate like this with a positive charge on the adjacent carbon. All right, you look tired.
Go home and think about what you've learned, and we'll talk again on Wednesday.